Thank you. Um, I'm Simon, and I've just freshly became a developer for Metabase, which is a closure-based open source uh, BI analytics tool. So if you're working with data, check it out. But today, I'm going to talk about something completely different. Um, I was recently, I was looking back at the previous year of conferences and thinking about which talks resonated the most with me. And it was quite clear that the ones I loved the most were those where people just went and built something, where they did something for fun. So, and like, actually my favorite talk of the last year was our very own Karen Meyer speaking right here at Euroclosure 2016 um, about the evolution and how can we use spec and things like that. And that talk really kind of stayed with me, especially just her, her enthusiasm and sense of playfulness. So I'm hoping that I'll be managed to channel some of that today to you as well. So what we're going to do is um, quite a bunch of things. We're going to build um, an AI, I guess this is going to sort of a, the theme for this day, um, that's going to play a silly little game, uh, Saving a Princess. And we're going to, do, we're going to build this AI by um, employing what's known as reinforcement learning, but with a twist. We're going to train it we're using a completely new, hot, or this very hyped algorithm, and we're going to implement that algorithm starting from the paper and trans transferring it into closure code using Neanderthal, which you also heard today. But we're also going to take it one step further and try to make it kind of massively parallel using Onyx. So it's going to get a kind of combination of all my favorite technologies and some massings on machine learning and stuff like that. So let's get started. The game is rather simple as, and as you can we'll soon find out the princess doesn't really need saving, but whatever. So what we're going to try to do is um, have our hero code the princess um, by the shortest path possible. You can move up and down, left and right. And we should be mindful that we don't fall off the edge into the endless void. So that's our game. Very, very simple. Just something that we have a small environment that we can play in. So what we're looking for is some kind of AI that figures out that it needs to go up, 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 and then left, 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 left. Pretty simple, but it turns out it kind of it does take some time for computers to figure this out. So, how do computers kind of play games? Uh, this is sort of using uh, computer games for researching AI has kind of came in vogue in the last couple of years, especially spearheaded by Google's DeepMind. Uh, and what the approach that they're kind of mostly using is what's known as reinforcement learning, which I think is kind of one of the cooler. Um, deep learning approaches or kind of machine learning approaches currently being present. Because I think overall, uh, in a lot of ways, if you look at what's kind of state of the art in terms of machine learning, it kind of, I think it kind of, it found this local optimum, but at the same time, we don't, we aren't really progressing towards like a proper general AI. And if any approach is kind of promising, I think it's reinforcement learning is the one which holds the most promise of being something actually kind of general or copying how we function in the world, at least from the more well-known approaches. Um, like the, the talk we heard previously today is also something that seems very interesting, but um, hasn't gained the prominence yet. Um, so basically, the idea with reinforcement learning is that we have an agent situated in the world, and this agent is interacting with this world, and it's kind of learnings by, by that. So it's kind of, we have some feedback mechanism where the agent makes various um, actions and then gets feedback from the environment, either immediately or in some uh, future point of time. And it, it, the, the idea is that we aren't here looking for one specific solution, one specific class or a, um, predicament, but rather what we're looking for is kind of a general um, approach of policy of how to act when the environment changes. So it's kind of, it does seem to have all kind of the building blocks of what we at least currently reckon also makes us think and is kind of component for general um, intelligence. So we have embodied cognition in the sense that the agent is actually interacting with the world. We have, the agent has to develop some kind of model of the world and of itself um, to kind of to pick the best action for given circumstances. One might even go as far as say that this is Fundamentally, the kind of the kernel of consciousness that you have both the, that you're both simulating yourself and your future actions, as well as kind of being able to step into another shoes or the kind of the shoes of your environment and thinking from that perspective. So there is this kind of a kernel of that there, and we also have this kind of a very classical um, carrot and stick approach to learning. 
So this is a pretty exciting technology, although like, currently how most people go about doing it is that they b build a huge, huge neural network, spend a lot of time, a lot of money training it, um, and, but we kind of with the added twist that um, instead of doing any sort of future engineering, future engineering meaning that like figuring out what kind of data to feed into a neural network, they just usually take a huge, um, basically just the screen, all the pixels, and just send that, and the network f first learns to kind of discern various things from the image, like we would, just kind of watching what's happening in our environment, and then actually builds on top of that understanding, which like, this approach is, obviously, it's very, very elegant, because you don't have to spend all the time thinking about feature engineering. It does also promise to be quite kind of generic, um, but it is also rather computationally expensive, as you can imagine, because we're actually kind of solving two problems at once, this little bit of machine vision, and then also trying to play our game. There is, however, another way to do this at least kind of in terms of training. And this is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, the paper that I've kind of mentioned a couple of times is uh, this is called Evolution Strategies as a Scalable Alternative to Reinforcement Learning. Um, and the kind of idea is rather a rehash of an old idea. That is to combine two of the main nature-inspired algorithms, neural networks and evolutionary algorithms, and use evolutionary algorithms to train a neural network. So kind of just some background. Um, in the classical evolution algorithm, the, the, the idea is that you have a population that kind of more or less well solves your problem, and then you take that population and you, some of, you mutate some of the uh, elements of it and you cross over some of the others, meaning mutate, you make a small change, or cross over, just kind of take two and make them copulate and get a new version of it. And then with that, create a new, bigger population, and then sample from that population, kind of weighted by how well they're performing in your tasks, and that gives you a next generation, and so forth, at um, an infinitum. Now, the algorithm presented here that we're going to look today is just kind of a, the idea is still the same, but it kind of, I guess it becomes more mathy, and instead of having this specific steps of crossover and mutation, what they just do is essentially just Jitter meaning just introduce some small amount of noise um, and then just uh, combine different uh, versions of the same we can wait it um, of the same you, you never kind of have a population per se or just kind of is as an intermediate step but then just have a one solution then try to very various different versions which are slightly different noisy and slightly different and then combine them together to the next solution but we'll go through the code later so it is kind of still the idea is the same but it's more in the Method domain and also like in some sense also like I do have to say it is I think more elegant Right, so when using an evolutionary strategy to train a neural network the kind of the core idea is that instead of using back propagation um, we use um, Evolutionary strategy on the weights. So kind of normally how you would train a neural network is you would kind of, you would have all the weights and then you would send your data through the neural network, get a result, and then look at the error of that result and then sl slowly kind of propagate that error back towards your network. And this is called um, backpropagation. But it does have s s numerous problems. Mo the biggest one, like the two main ones are that it is, um, like it does require, like it was already mentioned today, it does require uh, that your kind of fitness function is kind of more or less continuous and well behaved. It also like the deeper your network, the more problems you have because the information gets more and more lost as you traverse the network back. So there is kind of there is definitely room for improvement. And evolution strategies bring a couple of very nice um, features to the playground. First of all, they are highly parallelizable, much more so than uh, normal neural networks where you usually kind of parallelize them by just kind of training in batches and then combining. They are much more robust. They, you, ha you need to have, all, there's almost no hyperparameters to tune. Um, it's kind of much more stable. It doesn't care that much about properties of the reward function. This is very important because you can have like very uneven rewards or something like that, um, or maybe just kind of very late in time. So kind of it, there's a lot of lag between the action being taken and actually seeing what change this affected in the world. And the evolution algorithm just kind of doesn't really it doesn't really care about those things um, because like you aren't using uh, that so much you aren't you aren't propagating that so it kind of it can have very discrete jumps all around and that makes your life just kind of much easier and you don't actually gonna have to 
bend your problem to the mathematics of the tools you're using, which kind of solve it more directly. Um, it can also, like, if you want to make a more advanced version of it, it can also kind of exploit structure because um, instead of kind of viewing the entire network as this kind of uh, continuous flow of um, data or of errors going back, you can actually kind of do evolution on each individual layer or something like that. So if you have some well-defined structure, you can use that structure in your training again because you don't need this entire propagation. Um, and it is less uh, computationally expensive. It's, kind of, it's much, much cheaper to run. But this, on the other hand, which it, if we move to the downsides, the problem is that it also takes significantly longer to converge. So like, it seems that it's in terms of how fast it works, it seems to be roughly kind of on pair with um, what you'd get training a neural network because you kind of, it's faster, but, takes, but it takes more data and more steps. Um, but still, it does because all the other pro um, promising properties, and just because it's kind of it's simple and it's always kind of nice to have a simple building block rather than having something super complex. I do think it has kind of a lot of potential. And the other thing is that kind of, which sometimes might trip you up, is that it, you do because you're kind of working with introducing small amounts of noise and hoping for a change. Is that your network actually has to be um, does it, it? It can't be too stable because if Amount, some amount of noise doesn't really change the output. You have nothing to go on, and you're just going to get stuck. So this is something to kind of keep in mind. Right. So this was kind of a prequel, just kind of theoretical about what we're going on. But now let's get our hands dirty and kind of try to build the main components. So first, the evolution strategy. Um, this is kind of the entirety of the algorithm. So. And as it's uh, written in the article, nothing too super complex, but um, I think that it does give us a nice approach to that, and it's rather straightforward, which is also kind of nice. So, um, the, like, as I kind of briefly already outlined, the idea is that we start with some uh, initial solution, and then we create a couple of vectors of noise, where basically we're just sampling Gaussian noise. Um, and then we see what happens if we add that noise to our solution. We run it through our fitness function and see what we get back. Um, and then we just kind of weight all those results um, and use them to update our, our weight. So it, it doesn't have a selection, for instance, like the classical um, GA has, but rather it always uses all the solutions and just weighs all the permutations and just uses them uh, based on um, what they contributed to the overall to the overall performance. Okay, so um, the, how we're going to implement this is, as promised, using Neanderthal, which you already know is a blazing fast matrix algebra and linear algebra library. Um, it runs both on CPUs and GPUs. And like oh, when I say kind of massively fast, it's like at least an order magnitude faster than what you can get with vanilla Java. And I'm not saying not and this is Java, not even closure. Like basically. It, because it does really go down to the metal. It is also like it's one of those um, simply fantastic closure projects, which I think that even if you have, if you don't have much interest in the stuff I'm talking about today, just kind of look, go through the code because it's an amazing study in how to make closure code performant, or rather kind of any JVM code performant. This is like it's an amazing study in how to eke out every last bit of performance. Um, although it does, does also kind of carry some. Wait, uh, because it is at the same time was like the API is terse to put it nicely. It's kind of uh, sometimes it, it takes a while to wrap your head around, especially if you don't have any experience with kind of the underlying libraries like Atlas or Lepak. But um, once you get used to it, it is also it has immense expressive power, kind of sort of like reminiscence of something like J or K language, um, and it does also have kind of like a higher level library called Flow Kitten, which is kind of another spin on the kind of bringing category theory to closure. So you get various folds and fold, map folds and stuff like that, very optimized for working with the same data structures Neanderthal is also using. Right, so um, this is basically the entirety of the algorithm. Um, and we're going to now go walk through it and kind of see how it maps to what we're doing. So um, it's kind of a common approach. And I, think, like, I really like this idiom um, when you're kind of trying to do 
some form of machine learning. Usually, you want to iterate for some steps, and it's kind of closure primitive iterate, which is kind of obscure maybe. But here, it was, uh, this is what it was made for. So it's kind of a really elegant solution where we essentially kind of generate infinite number of iterations, but let's just take however much we want and uh, take the last of those, and that's our solution. Could also have instead of just take a fixed number, maybe have a predicate or something like that. Okay, so um, first, basically, we just we we sample from the Gaussian noise so here. We just kind of we we simplify our life somewhat and just take a kind of a matrix of those dimensions with that noise. So it's kind of pretty straightforward. And then we need to um, go through all the columns of that matrix and calculate what our new reward is going to be. So, and this is kind of here we encounter the first um, actual Neanderthal. That's the cryptic AX PY. PY. Um, so. Kind of what this does is it's kind of it's actually kind of a family of functions which kind of encode what they're doing. So you have the the general form is kind of is going to be one of those. Either you're kind of summing two vectors, or you're or you're multiplying one vector by a, by a number and then summing with the other, or you can kind of multiply first both and then summing them out. And the name, if you look at it, kind of encodes this. So we have a for the first scalar, and then we have x, p for plus, and then y. And the kind of the optional B is not in the name, and then it also kind of comes in the version with the bang sign where it actually um, mutates the last argument. And this is kind of um, what you'll notice is kind of it does a lot of things um, at once, and it's kind of cryptic, but it's also blazingly fast. Um, and once kind of at first, it's almost it seems that the the options offered by Neanderthal are too limited, but once you start kind of using it, you can. You get into the groove and you figure out that you can just kind of combine a couple of them and just kind of magic pulls out. So um, it is, I guess, also kind of a nice uh, complement to how mathematical or machine learning articles are usually written, which also kind of tend to be pretty terse and use um, quite condensed mathematical notation. And here we also kind of have probably like even higher expressive power using that. Um, I mean, I guess the acronyms should help, although like, I'm pretty dyslectic, so I'm always kind of useless with what the, what the actual letters mean. I have to kind of either think or look at the documentation, but that's kind of probably the only downside, honestly, to Neanderthal is just that. But I, I think that um, it's kind of a, I would like, I like that we also have another option in um, core dot matrix, which oftentimes, like, if you want to kind of do some quick prototyping or something like that, this is what I would turn to. But once we're talking about actually kind of implementing an algorithm for production, it's kind of Neanderthal all the way because of its kind of its performance and also just it's such well written code. It's kind of it's easy to trust it. Okay, so kind of a, a digression on Neanderthal, but otherwise what we're doing is kind of pretty straightforward. So as the name implies um, we're multiplying our noise by sigma, so we're just kind of making it essentially kind of s smaller in magnitude because otherwise we have this kind of normal distribution um, where the magnitude would be too high. So we kind of compress this and we add it to the to our initial weight, and then we look at what the rewards are going to be for that. Collect all the rewards in a new vector called rewards. Um, and then we have this, kind of, this step is actually one that where we deviate from what's in the um, article, and that's an additional step where we standardize, meaning that we um, essentially center, so we um, subtract the mean of the data and divide it by standard deviation. This is kind of this is something that um, is very often done if you look at kind of machine learning. Um, maybe sometimes it was kind of a bit of a cardinal cult when you don't know what to do. Just kind of oh, let's standardize this or let's put some normalization in here. Um, but it does kind of it tends to help with kind of c things converging faster and so forth. If you read the paper, they actually have a discussion on this and kind of at least theoretically, it's a step that's not needed. But when I was kind of if you look at their their actual implementation, they're using it. And I was like when I was toying around with it, it does seem to make um, convergence happen slightly faster. So. Yeah, but it's one of those things where it's a bit of a like, black art. And then we have the, the last step of our algorithm where, again, we're kind of leveraging the full uh, potential of Neanderthal. And what we're doing is that we want to sum up uh, the contributions of all the uh, slightly perturbated uh, weights and add them to our initial weight. And we also kind of normalize this by 
um, learning, le learning rates, so we, can, we don't have too big of a jumps in how much our um, guess of the solution changes. And here the MV uh, bank stands for matrix vector multiplication bank, meaning that we're going to um, mutate the last argument. And so what happens is that first we calculate this um, damping factor by taking the learning rate and dividing it by population size and sigma again. So this is just kind of population size because um, we're going to sum up many of them. So this is essentially sort of like um, doing the mean and then sigma because we multiply there, we need to remove that signal. And learning rate is the kind of the damping where we, was, we say that, okay, we don't want to have very big steps in our algorithm. So that's kind of our damping. We multiply this damping by with our noise matrix. And then we multiply the noise matrix with the rewards so that we get kind of each, then um, each row in the matrix becomes weighted by its reward. And we add that to our initial weight, producing the final solution. Here, um, like as, if you look at the code up there, it, there is also a m um, more readable solution available. If you just kind of, instead of doing this all MV thing, you could also just first um, do, um, like the algorithm says, kind of pairwise multiplication and then reduce with vector summation. You get the same result. Probably kind of more readable, but I wanted to kind of highlight some more in the end of all. Though, like, to be honest, I would be kind of, if it weren't super performance critical, I'd be very tempted to go with a more readable version. And also, you can see I'm not a huge fan of various um, Greek letters and one letter names, so everything is kind of nicely written down. This is something that I wholeheartedly um, up, 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 um, appeal to you to do the same because it just makes everyone's life that much easier when you're kind of reading code and trying to figure out what's going on. Right. So if you want to make this paralyzed, what now? It's already kind of. Um, as promised, we're going to be using Onyx. This is Onyx is like a, it's a closure stream processing framework. Um, one of my favorite closure projects, probably. Um, kind of massively, um, massive amount of features and kind of keep uh, surprising us with what they're doing. So it's really kind of another thing. Do check it out, even if you don't really care about what I'm talking about here. Um, and like the nice thing with Onyx is that it kind of it really decouples various things that you do because like oftentimes setting up something like if you think about setting a something like a Spark uh, cluster that it's pretty tedious and many things kind of coupled in, together and so forth and with Onyx it's kind of very nicely um, decomplected and using just closure data structures to describe your entire computation so basically the three main components be, have it being the workflow which is the graph of how your data moves through the system then you have working on the workflow you have flow conditions which determine what, when to flow values from one node to the other so you can have kind of conditional execution and so forth and then there's the catalog where we can explain where we define all the components we're using Mm. Hey, the only thing that I would kind of draw your attention to is that we, for the actual computation, we're using normal closure functions. The only kind of protocol is that they need to accept a, a map, which is called a segment, and they need to return, again, a map or a vector of maps, and that's kind of the entirety of being compliant with the Onyx protocol. protocol. So it's, kind of a, it's a very straightforward step from taking the code that we've written previously and change it to of various um, Onyx nodes and being processed like that. So, kind of, and really, like, and this is going to be probably, if there's going to be a recurring theme with this talk, it's going to be just like, the power of describing all your computation with data. It's kind of just makes it so much easier to reason about and also kind of manipulate and change. Maybe, like, one more thing here. Um, if you notice also, you can do things like bind parameters and things like, like that, which is again kind of useful for in machine learning context for various um, hyperparameters and such. Like if you remember, like our code does have some parameters, you know, just kind of as defaults, but it kind of one way where you can use um, this parameter binding is to kind of use different ver values or something like that, and we don't need to actually touch our code for just when instance, for instance, experimenting with various. Uh, hyperparameter configurations and such. Right, so um, our entire, the, turning the, our algorithm into kind of an Onyx job is basically described by this topology. So we're going to, we start with um, 
like our, the our initial solution coming in. Then we populate, meaning we generate the entire population. We jitter each, each of them, meaning we introduce the noise. And then we collect them all and update our weight. And then either recur back to where we were or send the final solution out. And then there's also the kind of the monitor leaf, which is something that kind of is like one of the niceties if you're using kind of a proper flexible system. Um, because you want, imagine this kind, of, this kind of a job running for a couple of hours, I mean, a couple of days. So you would really want to figure out what's going on as the job is running. And here, what we do is just kind of attach another uh, function which gets uh, data, for instance, every 100 iterations and outputs it or saves it to the database or maybe streams it to some web app where you can see what's going on. So you, can, you have immediately kind of very in depth monitoring where you have access to all your data and it's something that's kind of attached to your code, we, we attached to your overall flow, workflow without introducing kind of additional uh, ballast into the code with just kind of like manually checking if epoch is divisible by 20, then print line, whatever, which is how these things are usually done otherwise. There's one, one small snag here though with this topology in that it's kind of, it's illegal because Onyx doesn't like uh, cyclic graphs, but there's kind of an easy trick we can do is in that kind of we introduce an additional step, I'm here I call it loop, which what does it's kind of, it's essentially an output step which writes to a channel, let's say an async channel, which is incidentally the same one that we're reading from and we get this kind of uh, feedback loop again without um, Onyx complaining. Or like if you did not do this for you know, kind of a more serious setting, it probably makes sense to have some other kind of message bus where you can also inspect what's going on and maybe serialize things in between and so forth. Uh, there's sort of like one kind of downside to this kind of topology is that um, our update become, is kind of stateful because it needs to accumulate state the entire generation. So let's say if our population is 100, it needs to kind of collect 100 of those changes and then do the calculation, um, which as being functional programmers is not ideal, but it's also not as problematic as you might, might think because luckily Onyx is rather good at solving these kind of problems. Um, it does a couple of things. Um, all the window and grouping functions are checkpointed. You have various flux policies, meaning if like one of your nodes goes down, you can decide how, like, whether a job's going to continue or not, and if any, kind of con any invariants are broken. And it also has, and this is a big one for machine learning, it has a concept of resume points. So you can actually transfer state from job to job. What this means is that I can have my algorithm running, and then if I find some bug or I figure out an improvement, I can actually kind of just update my job and continue from the resume point where I am without having to kind of go from the beginning or dumping my current state and kind of reloading or something like that, but can just essentially hot patch and continue from this resume point, which is uh, rather nice. And obviously, it also adds a lot of in terms of just resilience, because even if parts of your class go down, you do have a pretty decent chance that the whole thing is going to continue. And like here, I would also say like use this kind of more and more, I have to say that computational graphs, just kind of describing how your data flows is such a good way of um, organizing your processing code. And I think it's something that kind of should be used more widely, not just when kind of doing this heavy, low, heavy, way, uh, heavy lifting, but essentially kind of next step, the moment you don't have, like I love threading macros, but like the moment you have a flow that's more complex than just a linear flow, start thinking about having um, some graph description of your job and then kind of work on that. There are already a couple of closure approaches to that. Um, so for instance, like the um, prismatic uh, has one and I, th I think that uh, I've seen one that's kind of trying to mimic the API of Onyx. So kind of, there are some approaches, but it's also kind of something that's pretty lightweight to write if you have some specific needs. But do kind of, I find that it kind of massively simplifies code, especially if you kind of go all the way and also do things like Onyx does in terms of then decoupling your error handling and so forth from your processing and then kind of lesser concern at each step. Okay, so now the, the other big part, um, the policy network. Here, we're going to use Cortex, which is a relatively newcomer to, to the scene. So, um, machine learning framework, I suppose, mostly f focused right now on neural networks written entirely in Clojure. It, it has a very nice, kind of very idiomatic API. They are 
they're also like on the computation coded as data bandwagon, kind of using it extensively and to very good effect. Um, and kind of built using core dot matrix, which on the one hand is nice, but also like in our concrete case, it's going to mean that we're going to have kind of convert things back and forth from the Neanderthal format to core dot matrix, which is far from ideal and kind of still, in just in terms of speed, Neanderthal is much faster. So kind of would be happy if it were Neanderthal, but I do understand that just because they also want to position themselves as being this kind of playground for experimenting with different al algorithms, it does make also sense to just use um, core matrix for its nicer API. So, um, and this is basically the entire description of the network we'll be using, um, which first we're gonna does speak to the qualities of Cortex, but also kind of like our problem is relatively simple. So the idea is that um, we're going to encode our whole grid as kind of one huge vector. So not exactly doing machine vision, but also just at least kind of try to keep the spirit of it and then encode princess as one and hero as minus one. So we have basically a vector with two um, very sparse vector, which is kind of two values, and it's going to be our input. Um, and then we're just going to have a single hidden, hidden layer of 40 units um, and then a final layer of four units representing the four possible dimension, directions where our hero can move. Um, and like we're using the bare bones one uh, version here. Now, like this is also like one of the niceties of using um, ES is that we like although this is something that's probably will need much more research and much more thinking, but it does seem that you don't need some of the tricks you're otherwise employing just to make the neural network converge faster, so the overall topology can be simpler. Also, like if because like the depth in a lot of ways is just us trying to massage networks into a form that's better to learn um, or kind of to work around the deficiencies of learning, um, while at the same time like there is this um, universal approximation theorem, a theorem which says that um, a neural network of finite size with just one hidden layer can already kind of approximate any function to an arbitrary degree. So like we don't need these kind of very deep topologies. Sometimes they're useful if you want to kind of use do what's called transfer learning, so maybe take just one chunk of the network and uh, use it somewhere else. But oftentimes, it's just kind of a deficiency we're using to work around um, our algorithms, and here it seems that it is kind of simpler. It also kind of brings me to this um, mini rant that uh, oftentimes it seems that uh, a lot of the secret of making machine learning successful is just having enough experience to know the magical combination of different topologies and parameters. And, but at the same time, because of how the publishing system is set up, it's not something that's going to get published. And also, like, there are economic incentives to have this locked up in your head and then get sold to tens of millions of dollars. But I think like, it's also making a huge disservice to the advancement of this because there's so much progress just in terms of how to actually kind of combine things together rather than developing new algorithms and such. So, and again, simplifications are also nice from this perspective. Um, but yeah, like if our problem would become much more complex, it also need to be bigger even, and like even this uh, rather small network still has, if you kind of then go through it because it's fully connected, does have about 16,000 weights. So even here, the learning problem is kind of pretty big. That's also like first I was hoping to do um, an actual live demo, but it just kind of takes way too long to, um, to converge on my computer. And also like here, the other example, just kind of to show you this power of describing the computation as data, because what we need like, right now, we have a couple of different layers, but we need to extract um, all the weights out of them, so we can just kind of train them as one big vector. And because it's just a closure data structure, we essentially just kind of walk the components and then combine all of them together, and we get one huge vector that we can then feed into our um, evolutionary strategy. Okay, so now the last building block, our game. Uh, so it is kind of a very straightforward, just kind of some ideas behind it, like the. Um, the costs are kind of set so that you have three different categories. Like first of all, you, you want to super pen penalize w a falling off the edge of the world. So it's kind of the first thing we're hoping that you're going to kind of get trained in this one. It's also pretty straightforward if you think about it, because it's just like if I'm at the edge, it's like one of the directions shouldn't be connected rather than have a weight very close to zero. So this is something that can be learned pretty quickly. And then we have the problem of just kind of wandering around, not finding the princess. So we do kind of impose an artificial limit of how many steps uh, can be done, or if not, kind of the game stops. And then if the princess is found, we want kind of the shortest path. So in that case, we use the actual kind of distance um, 
of how many steps it took to find the princess to, um, versus the optimal distance. So this is kind of this um, turns minus min turns. So we'll get the most aggressive and the most direct solution. Um, and then like, we also need to plug this into some more um, infrastructure, I guess, in terms of our reward function. We want to play the entire game, although here, kind of, strictly speaking, it wouldn't be necessary, but it's kind of a more realistic example of if you want to do planning where maybe the effects of um, your decisions won't be entirely reflected in the next step, so we play the entire game. And also, we collect actually multiple playthroughs uh, to lessen the effect of randomness, because if you think like it might be just kind of a lucky draw and the game gets initialized with um, the hero and the princess being adjacent spaces, and then it's kind of relatively simple to find, so we want some robustness against that, so we'll do kind of batches of 10 runs. This also means kind of that our, uh, it plays um, towards our parallelization strategy, because this is going to get relatively expensive. It's going to be pretty cheap because it's a small, silly game, but running this kind of 10 times or even 100 times would get relatively expensive, so it's going to make sense to have those split and run on different nodes. nodes. And with that, we're kind of nearing the end. So um, kind of how to sum up all this kind of a whirlwind uh, tour that uh, we went through today. Uh, it's kind of, basically, it's, it's kind of very simple. Just, um, explore and follow your fancy. If you find something kind of that fascinates you, either as a concept, as a technology, or just a library, go have fun and play with it and kind of go on adventures. Um, and now, if you have any questions, let's start an adventure of our own. Thank you.